to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's topic is 3.4, Conservation of Biodiversity. This will be a quick review to help you prepare for mock exams and those official examinations at the end of the school year. Good luck. Let's get into it. The first significant idea here is that the loss of biodiversity is what's driving efforts to conserve it. And those efforts to conserve biodiversity are greatly influenced by one's environmental value system. The variety of arguments given for the conservation of biodiversity, of course, depends on those environmental value systems that we've discussed back in topic one. If you look at this graphic, how much tropical forests absorb and store carbon, is this more of an anthropocentric or a technocentric or an ecocentric approach? You should be able to justify whatever conclusion you come to based on evidence or scientific reasoning. The next big idea in ESS topic 3.4 is that there are differing approaches to the conservation of biodiversity. You can see those here on the slide. You're either going to target the habitat or focus on specific species. Arguments about species and habitat preservation can be based on aesthetic, ecological, economic, ethical, and social justifications. Again, the ecological perspective argues that rare or endemic species may be lost and that it is necessary to conserve the habitat or species because of their role in food systems and productivity. From a technocentric perspective, may be argued from the economic point of view about ecotourism and medicinal compounds that are derived from plants. Those are some of your ecological goods that we derive from protecting habitats. There's also the ethical argument about bio rights that skews towards the ecocentric end of the spectrum. And then of course, the social argument for conserving biodiversity is that habitats provide homes, work, resources, and social cohesion for indigenous people. That will be somewhere in the ecocentric to anthropocentric end of the EBS spectrum. You should be able to discuss how different governments or organizations use different tools or strategies to promote the conservation of biodiversity. The logo here on the screen, this panda, is probably the most famous logo in the world after the McDonald's Golden Arches. This shows that WWF has mastered the use of media to motivate people for biodiversity conservation. There's a range of government and non-government organizations involved in conservation of biodiversity. The International Union of Conservation of Nature, IUCN, publishes the Red List, which is considered the comprehensive guide to the conservation status of many species on earth and that list is used to guide decision making different organizations have different degrees of effectiveness big gigantic organizations such as the united nations have a global spread and influence but they're also quite bureaucratic which restricts their effectiveness. Smaller grassroots organizations have a much smaller scale of operation, but because they are small and they operate only in one or two areas, they tend to be locally effective, but minimally effective on a larger scale. International conventions on biodiversity create collaboration among nations. One of the most famous conventions that you'll encounter in the ESS syllabus is CITES, the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species. This came into effect in the 1970s and has actually been quite successful, particularly in combating the poaching of elephants and rhinos in East Africa. One of the things you'll probably be asked to do on an ESS exam, either in paper one or paper two questions, is to discuss or evaluate habitat-based approaches versus species-based approaches to biodiversity conservation. The habitat approach focuses, as you might guess, on protecting the entire habitat and all of the species that live there. The species-based approach is very narrowly focused on target species, generally ones that are very critically endangered or near extinction. Both approaches have benefits, both approaches have limitations, and so most conservation efforts fall somewhere in the middle where we call a mixed approach, using the strengths of each to offset the weaknesses of the other. Perhaps in a case study for paper one, you might be asked to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of a named protected area. And there are many factors we use to evaluate protected areas. One is the size of the area. A large area is better than a small area. The shape of the area, as you can see on the left side, this is a more round shape that reduces what we call the edge effect. The edge effect is where the core protection zone is close to or interacts with areas of human habitation 
or areas with greater degrees of human influence. A big area is better than a small area, a round area is better than a long narrow strip, an area that has not been split or fragmented by roads or infrastructure are better. The fewer disruptions to the core, the better the efforts at conservation. Criteria for evaluating protected areas include looking at the shape of the protected area. The closer the area is to being round, the better it is because the perimeter or the edge effect is minimal with a round shape. When you have long, narrow, skinny shapes, the core becomes very small and the edge space becomes quite large. If it's not possible to design one big core area, the next best approach is to design several smaller core areas and connect them through corridors to allow wildlife to migrate back and forth between the protected areas. Species-based conservation strategies. The CITES convention falls into this category because it identifies species by name. Species that fall within the vulnerable, threatened, endangered, critically endangered categories of the IUCN Red List show up on the CITES list. They're categorized into Appendix 1, 2, or 3 based on the degree of threat, and that convention prohibits international trade in those very specific cases. Here you have the California condor that is part of a captive breeding program that's actually been quite successful. California condors were almost entirely wiped out in the 1980s. So conservationist, conservation biologist took a bunch of eggs from their nests. They brought them into secure areas and they raised condors from hatchlings to maximize the care and protection that they could get. You'll notice also there's a hand puppet from the human on the left side that looks like a mama vulture feeding the condor. You'll also notice the hand puppet on the left that looks like a mama condor feeding the chick condor. That's so that chicks don't become acclimatized or used to human presence. This helps boost the success of their reintroduction in the wild which is one of the frequent criticisms of species-based conservation because often animals that have been reared in close contact with humans lose the ability to hunt on their own and fend for themselves in wild situations. So the success of their reintroduction into wild habitats tends to be quite low. Reintroduction. The idea here is that we remove individuals of the target species, we bring them into a protected area, raise them, increase their populations, and then take them back to their original habitat and release them into the wild. It sounds good in premise. It tends to be quite expensive and it tends to have mixed results because it doesn't directly address the habitat loss, which is frequently one of the primary factors that the species is threatened in the first place. Species-based conservation is frequently based on the use of a flagship species. This is like the WWF logo with a panda on it. A flagship species is one that is considered charismatic or famous. It draws people attention. It makes people feel warm and fuzzy but that's different from a keystone species. A flagship species is famous, but a keystone species is critically important for the functioning of an entire ecosystem. A flagship species might be a keystone species, but generally speaking, if a flagship species disappears, the entire ecosystem isn't going to collapse. Whereas if a keystone species disappears, the ecosystem is at risk of collapse because the food webs will fall apart. When asked to evaluate conservation efforts, one of the things you have to look at is how they benefit people. Because let's face it, if people don't benefit from conservation efforts, they will fail. People will look out for themselves first. We've seen that pattern throughout human history. So if the surrounding communities don't benefit from the conservation effort, a protected area is likely to enjoy less success. The location of a conservation area is also an important factor when evaluating the success of that area. This is an image of Nairobi National Park right outside of the biggest city in Kenya. The benefits of it being that close are that people have regular contact with the animals and they become aware of the conservation status of those animals. The drawback is that people have regular contact contact with the animals, and that threatens the animals because sometimes there are accidents on the road with vehicles. Those animals may stray beyond the boundaries of the park, in which case they're encroaching on human settlements, and that leads to human-animal conflict. You may be asked to explain the criteria used to design and manage protected areas. Here we have a bunch of protected areas in Nepal, the blue ones along the northern and northwestern borders. You see one in the middle near Annapurna, is quite large simply from its size and its almost round shape you might conclude that that could be a very successful protected area then if you look in the southwest near bardia and banke you have two long skinny conservation areas which
which means they have a lot of edge effect, a small core zone, and if you look at where they are on the map, they tend to be far away from other conservation areas, which inhibits the migration of animals in and out of those zones. As part of your ESS case study in paper one, you might be asked to evaluate the success of a named protected area, or it could be part of one of those structured essays in a paper two question, or it could be part of one of those paper two structured essay questions that are used those nine mark bands. If you're asked to do that on paper two, you need to be able to consider the size, the shape, the edge effect, corridors, the proximity to human settlements, the fragmentation of the habitat, and the benefit of the local community when determining whether that area is or is not or may or may not be successful. Pretty much every year, you're going to encounter some kind of a question about evaluating habitat-based approaches to conservation versus species-based approach to conservation. Broadly speaking, habitat-based approaches will be better because they are more holistic and they actually protect the entire ecosystem and more than just one species, so they conserve all biodiversity or a larger proportion of biodiversity, whereas species-based conservation may benefit one or two target species, but tend to be more expensive and overall less successful in the long run, unless also combined with habitat-based conservation efforts. That's it for the quick review of ESS Topic 3.4, Conservation of Biodiversity. I hope you found this video helpful as you prepare for your exams. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. Good luck and happy learning.